All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly Episode 77, bringing you all the best JavaScript news in a podcast form. And we have some really awesome stuff today, so without further ado, let's get started. Uh, first, as usual, getting started section. The first article we got here today is why I like JavaScript optional chaining, which really is a very nice introduction to the optional chaining, the ES 2019 feature, I believe. Or No, wait, not 19. 19 is already finalized. So probably ES 2020 feature, which is currently at stage three and uh, is probably going to be finalized quite soon, uh, which is absolutely awesome. And one of my most favorite features that I cannot wait to uh, basically use in Node.js specifically. So if you never heard about it or if you have any interest in uh, investigating how it works, this is a really good starting point. Next article we got here is building a command line real time chat app using socket IO, a pretty nice tutorial on how to build your own command line chat app using socket IO and REPL module specifically. So if you ever wanted to do something like this, do check this one out. It is very basic, but it basically teaches you everything you need to know about socket IO and REPL modules. Next article we got here is text to speech in the browser with web speech API, a very nice tutorial for the web speech API, the speech synthesis that is basically kind of standardized, I guess. I mean, there is work in progress. So the standard is not yet, I think finalized, but it is there and it works perfectly fine in at least uh, Chrome and I believe partially in Firefox. So if you ever wanted to synthesize speech in the browser with JavaScript, well, this is a very good starting point. Next article we got here is JavaScript to know for react from Mr. Can see dots. Um, a really good write up on what you have to know and what exactly those things do before starting to work with react JS. So if you are just in the beginning of your JavaScript career and you want to know what exactly do you need to know before you go into react, and this is probably the best write up I've seen out there. So make sure to check this one out. Next thing we got here is using request animation frame with react hooks, a very nice tutorial on uh, how to use react and uh, blah, blah, blah. let's try this again, how to use request animation frame with react hooks. And when exactly do you actually want to use it? Uh, for example, instead of set timeouts and stuff like this, when it can actually help you? I mean, again, you know, if you know what request animation frame is, you probably wouldn't actually need to know when to use it, but rather how to use it with hooks and what are kind of the caveats that you have to keep in mind when using it. All right, continuing, we got a guide for refs in React. Yet another write up on using refs in React this time around, including the refs with hooks. So this is something I don't think I've been covered that much. So if you are just getting started with React and you're a bit confused with the use ref hook and uh, the refs in general, then do check this one out. It does a pretty good job of quickly outlining what it is and how to use them. Next article we got here, and I think this is already where, no, I don't think, wait a second, I, I forgot how did I, no, this is still getting started. So this is the last article in the getting started section. It's called functors from the first principle explained with JavaScript. And it's a very nice description of what functors are and how do you apply them and what do they actually mean that something is a functor, right? Uh, if you are getting started uh, with functional programming, you might've heard the word functors. It might be a bit confusing at first, but it's in reality, it's actually a pretty simple concept. And this article does an amazing job of explaining it. So if you are interested in functional programming and wanted to know what functors are, then well, just go through this article and you will likely understand it quite well by the end of it. Okay, that is it for the getting started section. Now we're going to the articles and news. And the first article of today is symbiotic definitely typed a pretty neat write up on uh, publishing the JavaScript libraries with TypeScript support. So there's the author goes uh, into the discussion of whether you know, so like when you write in JavaScript, and people want TypeScript types, you typically have two ways to do that. The one is when someone uh, who knows TypeScript contributes the typings to your repositories. This is what typically happened with my tiny libraries. But there is a problem with that. Because as soon as you get a pull request uh, with changes, you can actually not really review it because you don't have an expertise with TypeScript because your project is JavaScript, right? So there's a problem and you either have to wait for maintainers or collaborators who know TypeScript to review it and it could take ages. Or there's another way you can actually use the definitely type project, which is the at types uh, user space. 
in npm uh, or i think it was called a group or whatever anyway and publish your uh, types through their definitely typed repo because that would mean that it will get maintained and uh, managed and reviewed by a team that basically works on TypeScript and they will manage the types, which is a very nice approach. And uh, if you are working with projects that use uh, TypeScript, then definitely check this one out. There's additional information, obviously, on how you can do it so that the types install automatically, which is actually super straightforward. You just add them as a dependency, <laughs> which is, uh, yeah, makes perfect sense. And there's additional discussion and notes uh, from a bunch of other maintainers here in the comments. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Hey, Frontend Nexus, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got recursion optimization in JavaScript, where it is, PDC, TCO, and FUD. Uh, so this is a pretty good write-up that investigates what happened to the proper tail calls and tail call optimizations that are up to this date, so they were discussed as a feature of the original ES6 or ES2015 back in 2014, I think, or something. And up to this date, the only browser that actually supports them, I believe, is Safari. And the article goes on to look, what is the difference between the proper tail calls and tail call optimization? What happened to the proper tail calls? And why is there essentially delays to the tail call, to shipping tail call optimization? It seems like majority of time is just like political stuff, actually. It's like there is a lot of talks and a lot of them are very um, heavily opinionated, let's put it this way. I mean, some of them are for the good reason, but it seems like it's a very political situation in general. But uh, nonetheless, it's a very interesting uh, sort of insight into what exactly is happening with this proposal and where are we at right now. So if you have any interest, make sure to check this one out. Next article we got here is using native JavaScript modules in production today. A very thorough write-up on a script type module as in, you know, the browser part of it, not Node.js yet because it technically doesn't really have them yet because they are behind the flag and experimental. But it already works in, in the modern browsers and you can already use them and there is a way to essentially load the old code using the script no module and script type module for the new code. So this is the sort of emerging pattern, let's put it this way. And the article goes into a discussion showing off, okay, first of all, when it makes sense to use this pattern, what kind of things can you actually do when you are using it? What kind of tools can you use? What kind of bundlers can help you? What is the optimal bundling strategies? What is the code splitting, dynamic code splitting and stuff like this? So if you are working with a modern code base and you one of your targets is the modern browsers that actually support ES modules and you want to make JavaScript modules loading the JavaScript within those browsers uh, bleh, within those browsers more efficient definitely check this article out there is a ton of really cool tips and tricks here uh, for example I didn't know you can actually preload modules using a link rel module preload tag this is this was completely new for me and there is a bunch of other very interesting points here, which I never um, even thought about, to be honest, before reading that. So if you're working with modules, if you're shipping relatively complex app and you are targeting the modern browsers that support script type module, I would highly recommend looking through this article because there is a ton of very interesting information here. All right, continuing, we got modern React testing, three part article that talks about best practices demonstrates how to test React with Jest and Enzyme, and my favorite way with Jest and React testing library. I think this is kind of borderline on getting started because it sort of you know covers the very basics of testing, let's put it this way. But on the other hand, it does require quite a bit of background knowledge and understanding of how the React, Jest, uh, and a bunch of other things work before you get started. This is why I put it into the article section. Now, if you're already working with React and you are just getting into testing and you are not sure where to get started, then this is probably the best starting point you can find out there aside from the obviously the official documentation for uh, React testing library, Enzyme, Jest, and so on and so forth. It does a very good job of outlining the best practices, the um, showing the how do you exec, how exactly do you test with the Enzyme, and then how you test with a Jest and React testing library. As I said, you know, this is my preferred way of testing things. React testing library makes testing incredibly simple and it's just a really joyful tiny library. So if you never used it, 
or maybe you're testing right now with Enzyme or something similar, do check at least the React testing library part out because it demonstrates how much easier your tests can be basically. All right, continuing, we got meta programming in JavaScript, write your first code mode. So we had the part one in the previous podcast and it talked about what the code modes are and what is the meta programming and how you apply it in JS. Now here is a more, mo yeah. let me try that again. Here is a more hands-on article that shows you specifically how to build your own code mode using JS code shift and how to do a bunch of things on your code base, like for example, stripping console log from your uh, files in CI and then how to run this in your CI environment and stuff like this. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's a very good tutorial. It does a good job of demonstrating how to do the basic tasks and also talks about more advanced ones like trying to detect sensitive tokens within your uh, code base in CI again, using entropy value for strings, which is a pretty nice approach and uh, usually pr provides uh, pretty good results. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next article we got here is the native file system API, simplifying access to local system. Uh, now this is the experimental API that is currently behind the flag in Chrome 77, which is the beta branch. And I believe it is uh, available without a flag in Chrome 78, which is a dev branch, should be stable in October and probably is gonna be shipped there um, as the title says here with uh, you know with all the capabilities unlocked. Now the native file system API essentially gives you access to the file system of a user, like a full access where you can read and write files, which is one of the features that we're basically lacking from the browser to turn it into you know a complete um, application platform, right? So we already have access to Bluetooth, we have access to cameras, media, like desktop capturing, whatever the hell you can imagine. The only missing bit or one of the few missing bits was the file system. And now we have this file system API, which you can try and use today. I mean, there are still some caveats here, so not everything is working. The current implementation in Chrome is not quite the spec compliant, which is something to keep in mind. So, you know, if you write something now that is not an experiment, it's probably gonna break once the specification is finalized. But nonetheless, it is quite cool to see that. I would be very interested to see if we're gonna get uh, something like VS Code completely in browser where you, you know, you don't even have to install it. You just go and open a folder and work with a in, because I mean, just look at the code sandbox, right? It's already VS Code working in a browser, but it has its backend because it has to communicate, like somehow access the files. Imagine doing that, but with a files on your own file system where you don't even need a backend. That just sounds awesome. So yes, quite exciting. If that sounds interesting, do check out the article. It does a pretty good job of introducing the whole thing and outlining the current caveats and issues. Uh, and yes, again, you know, it's not, the spec is not completely final, so there's probably gonna be changes, but it does look very promising. All right, uh, next thing we got here is one of my favorite articles this week. It is from the Figma uh, engineering team, and it's called how to build a plugin system on the web and also sleep well at night. Now, this is a very long article, but I would absolutely recommend reading it to everyone. So this talks about how the Figma, if you never heard about them, they are doing this sort of uh, online uh, web browser based design uh, app, I guess, uh, where you can build your own designs, you know, and then export them to preview and CSS and stuff like this is pretty complex. I've, I've used it as a developer looking at the designs, not, you know, I never could figure out how the hell it works because it's, all alien to me. Nonetheless, it is a really cool app and um, recently they, they introduced plugins. Now, this outlines their journey of figuring out how exactly they can allow third-party code to run within the platform in a secure and fast way. So there was like, you know, a bunch of restrictions obviously, and it walks you through the whole um, process of them trying to figure out how to make plugins work. So they, they have like a bunch of obviously requirements here. And then they describe three or four attempts at doing this, starting with an iframe sandboxing, which is, you know, the obvious way, okay, let's just run everything in iframe and then communicate, let the iframe communicate with the main thread, which means that the browser handles the sandboxing and we just basically talk to it, right? Now, uh, one of the problems 
uh, which I found to be actually quite interesting. One of the problems with the iframe usage was that uh, before, so you had to do a way, uh, they, had the, they have the Figma API, uh, the SDK, I guess, and then you can await Figma load scene. So you load the specific scene from the main thread, then you do modifications on that scene. Then you do Figma update scene. So you flash the changes back to the main thread. Now, uh, this works fine with a small size uh, things, right? And there's two problems. So the first problem, which actually surprised me a lot, they found that a sync await is not user friendly enough. There's apparently people who were confused by the needs to use a sync await because it was, you know, confusing to them since it's supposed to be like, they expected the plugin to be synchronous, which is, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess, I'm not sure why this happens, but this this makes I looking at the longer examples they have here when you have to do multiple updates at different times, this makes sense. You know, it's like obviously you can batch them, but this doing this a lot of times looks a bit weird, to be honest. Now, the second problem with this approach was the scene, uh, like large scenes. Like they they have some clients like Microsoft that has essentially entire design systems in there. And as they say, so it took around 14 seconds just to serialize the doc document and send it to iframe, which is mind blowing. Just imagine the size of the document. And then at some points they say they basically, the documents were so large, they actually hit the memory limits within the browser to send it to iframe. So they, on during the serialization, it basically throw out of memory exceptions, which is just insane. So they thrown out this approach and uh, the second approach they did was, oh yes, right. They took the JavaScript compiler and compiled it to WebAssembly because you know, what could be safer than running a separate JavaScript engine within WebAssembly and then compiling the user plugin code within it to actually execute it there. And <laughs> um, it worked as well as you might imagine. There's some obvious problems with that. And there's the write-up itself is not that um, long. And I mean, the interesting thing is it actually worked relatively fast for them as in, you know, they managed to compile the engine quite simply and uh, they managed to run it within the browsers without too many problems. But yeah, like JavaScript engine in a browser that already has JavaScript engine. <laughs> It's a bit weird, but hey, it actually kind of worked. Um, but it like essentially just read through it. There's some uh, amusing facts there. So the final attempt and the one that worked was actually using the realms. Uh, this is something that I believe is present in the Node.js itself. Uh, there is a, at least there's like the VM realm um, API there, but they had to build something like this uh, customly for the browser, right? So the idea is that you can use um, proxies and reflect API to actually sandbox the user code that is evaluated and fake the global scope so that it won't have access to any uh, global variables or the core of the app itself. So it won't be able to modify the Figma app and do anything malicious, which is uh, yeah, seems to work out quite nice for them. There is a lot more details here, obviously, to exactly how this works. Um, one of the, th like, this is a really awesome write-up. And again, I would encourage everyone to read that because there's so many cool detail, little details here and the whole, you know, they outline the whole process of like thought process and development process is just fascinating. Uh, one thing I am a bit, uh, I find a bit unfortunate is that they are, have not open sourced this Realm API that they essentially ended up building. So they do have this Realm shim that essentially, you know, takes the, uh, creates those Realms within the browsers and allows them to run the plugins safely. It would be absolutely awesome to see this as an open source uh, library on GitHub. They do have some things open source, but yeah, just I, I wish they would open source this tiny thing as well. But nonetheless, the article itself is Absolutely amazing. And again, I encourage everyone to read that. Right, continuing, we got another awesome article. So this is like my second most favorite thing this week. WebAssembly interface types, interoperate with all the things. So this is a write-up from uh, Lynn Clark from the Mozilla Hacks. And it is talking about the new things coming to WebAssembly, specifically interface types. Um, so if you ever worked with WebAssembly, you probably know that uh, the currently WebAssembly only understands numbers, right? So it can accept numbers and it can produce numbers. This is basically all it does. So whenever you want to do something complex, like 
processing strings, images, or whatnot, you have to first convert them into a array of numbers and then work on that array of numbers and then somehow return it back and then convert it back into the format that you actually want, right? Um, most of the time when you build WebAssembly modules in, I don't know, Rust or Golang or whatever, it comes together with a JavaScript wrapper that essentially does it for you. So you have a nice JavaScript API that is taking the string in and converts it under the hood into numbers, goes, gives it to the WebAssembly module, then WebAssembly module returns another array of numbers, it converts it back to a string and returns to your JavaScript code, right? It all works in a, a fine, but it's not very nice for module developers, it's not really nice for module users, there's basically problems with it. So the target of WebAssembly interface types is to just take one WebAssembly module and being able to load it into any environment as in, you know, JavaScript, PHP, Ruby, Python. I mean, there's already like a bunch of, uh, if, you, if you didn't know, this is another cool part. There is already a bunch of WebAssembly embeddable engines that you can use within PHP, Ruby, Python, and basically any other language. And the idea with types is that you can take this one WebAssembly file without any wrapping, without anything, right? Because if you do wrapper in JavaScript, you obviously cannot require that in PHP, for example, right? And uh, just to load that WebAssembly type and so that all the engine, the WebAssembly engine that loaded it actually knows the interface from the file itself. There is a um, presentation here, the video that actually shows off how it works. And obviously right now it is, um, it's not finished, so it's like experimental. But the thing is, it shows off that you can actually build one module. So in this case, uh, the author takes the uh, pull down CMARC module in Rust and makes a tiny library out of it that essentially renders Markdown or converts to, uh, string to Markdown and then loads this WebAssembly module as in just dot .vasm file in four languages, I believe, uh, including Node.js, uh, Python, Rust, and uh, there was something else. So it's literally just import markdown and then you just go markdown.render and it works. It is mind-blowingly awesome. And in my opinion, this is basically, once this is released, this is gonna change completely how we build the markdown modules. Because up until now, if you, again, if you ever tried building markdown, it was a pain in the ass. Because again, you need this wrapping code that actually translates stuff from the uh, WebAssembly, sorry, I did I say markdown, WebAssembly. You needed this wrapper that actually translates stuff from WebAssembly into JavaScript and then from JavaScript into WebAssembly. It was all very annoying unless it's code generated. Obviously, we had tools like Wasm bind gen for Rust and Golang has its own environment, but you know, it's all overhead, it's all annoying, and it's all unusable outside of JavaScript ecosystem, which is no longer the only ecosystem that uses WebAssembly. So, yeah, it is incredible like this this old demo this write-up and the idea of WebAssembly interfaces is absolutely mind-blowing really awesome and i think is going to propel WebAssembly uh, to the speed of light basically and the adoption is gonna jump a lot once this is released in all the engines basically so if you have even slightest interest in WebAssembly, the article is very long, but it's very detailed and it does explain quite a lot of really cool things. I would highly recommend you reading through that. All right, I think this is actually it for the articles. We are coming to the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness section. And the first thing we got here is the simulation in quotes of a black hole in 140 bytes of JavaScript. This is literally the whole snippet that you need and it looks like this. There is an actual article that explains how that works. So if you are into this kind of code and you know the min-maxing this stuff in JavaScript, do check it out, it's actually really cool. And uh, yeah, this is mind blowing that this is just like 140 bytes. Um, next thing we got here is flood fill image transition effect. One more uh, tiny snippet that shows you how to do that on your own. So if you are into the image modifications and wanted to do something similar, do check this one out. Next thing is an announcement from Microsoft. WebView to browser, uh, rich sample, um, sorry, WebView to browser, I guess. Uh, rich sample for WebView 2, we already talked about it. So Microsoft announced that the WebView 2 control that is coming to Windows 10 is gonna be powered by uh, Chromium-based Edge. 
Now this is available as a standalone demo, basically developer preview that you can take and use and try it out on your own. So if you are interested, do check it out. Next thing we got here is the GitHub blog announcement. GitHub now supports web authentication. So web with N for security keys. So if you have a browser that is capable of using web with N, you can now use stuff like U2F, UBK, uh, Touch ID, fingerprint readers, and Windows Hello to log in into your GitHub once you set it up, which is um, just awesome. So I have not tried it yet, but I really want to try it because that sounds like an absolutely amazing way to log in into stuff when you just, you know, you just have your browser authenticate for you. You don't need any passwords. This is just amazing, basically. There you go. All right, next thing we got here is the PSA uh, that promise.race, this is, I think this is a bug that beat me more than once. Promise.race will execute the side effects of losing promises because promises cannot be canceled. And uh, the idea is that, yes, yeah, so if you raise something and then the promise executes something after one of them finishes, this after, so the stuff that executes after the effect will work anyway disregarding which of the promises won, right? So this is something you have to keep in mind. If you're sensitive to this, just use RxJS, which basically makes it so that one of them, only one of them is executed. Next thing we got here is the 32-bit uh, support for JavaScript, BigInt and WebAssembly i64 interop is now landed in V8. So I guess this is one of the steps to the WebAssembly interface types. Uh, this is better interop between the BigInt and VASM environments. Always great to see that. So just a PSA, I believe this is only in the dev branch for now. Uh, so again, if you're using WebAssembly, do check it out. And the last thing we got here is this discussion in standard JS repo. So they are, mm, standard JS 14 was released. We're gonna take a talk about it in the next section, but uh, they've essentially added a small banner that appears when you do NPM install standard that shows a sponsored message from the uh, sponsors of the standard JS, right? Um, this is supposed to bring a bit more money to standard to allow them to fund themselves. And there's a discussion essentially into if that's okay with the users, are they annoyed by it? Should there be something different about it? Again, in my opinion, you know, it's uh, something that shows up on an install. It's not that obnoxious. It's just once when you install the stuff, it's not like you're gonna update it or install it every day. So in my opinion, you know, if it brings more funding to the team and if it allows them to be more flexible, then why the hell not? But as, as you can imagine, there's like a ton of people who are not happy about that. They complain about ads. They <laughs> complain about open source software trying to fund itself as usual. So um, yeah, there you go. Just a PSA, I guess. And uh, yeah, as I said, the releases section, the first release of the week is standard JS 14. Now supports ES 2019. There's 23 new rules that help you to catch bugs and make your code cleaner. It now lints MJS and CJS files automatically in preparation for the Node.js ES modules release, has a better git ignore and removes bundle.js from default ignore files. There's a full change log if you want to. And again, people are already complaining about the um, ads messages on installation in the comments. So there you go. All right, next release we got here is DateFunds version uh, 2.0. Um, so if you've never heard about it, DateFunds is a very nice library for working with dates. It's basically a better moment JS, uh, something like Lodash for dates, I guess, uh, is what you hear quite a lot. Now, if you are using DateFunds version one and you are migrating to version two, make sure to read the changelog. There is a ton of breaking changes. All of them make perfect sense, but there is a lot of them that we, you will have to refactor your code quite a bit. Uh, specifically, one of the things is like, you know, it's no longer uh, accepts the date string. So you actually have to pass in the date objects. And there's also some minor changes to format. So make sure to read that. They also give uh, the nice snippets that basically tell you how to convert your old code into the new one compatible with version two. So there's uh, the path seems to be relatively straightforward. So there you go. All right. Next release we got here is Node.js version 12.9. If you're living on the edge, good news. We got version uh, V8 version 7.6 update, which brings a ton of performance improvements as well as support of uh, big int in Intel methods and promise all settled. There's uh, also libuv update to 131 with a bunch of other nice features. Other than that, it's all like, um, I don't like, 
yeah, I, I guess none of the none of the other uh, minor upgrades is worth mentioning, basically. So if you're living on the edge, make sure to update because it will bring you a lot of performance improvements. Okay, and next update we got, uh, next release we got here is admin bro version 1.0. This is the I, th I don't remember if we talked about it. I remember seeing it somewhere, but I don't remember if I mentioned it in a podcast. This is the dashboard with the most ridiculous name ever, but nonetheless, this is a very nice uh, auto-generated admin panel for Node.js apps with React and a pretty nice looking UI. So they have finally released version 1.0 that now has access control, action hooks that you can allow you to customize the API and a bunch of other things. So if you're looking for an admin dashboard that could be auto-generated from your backend, then do check this one out. It's actually pretty good. Right, next release we got here is Web Template Studio version 2.0. So this is now a release and you can install it for VS Code and you can now produce a bunch of boilerplates right from your VS Code visually by selecting frameworks. I've heard mixed reviews from that. Some people say they really liked it. The other people say it never worked for them. So um, I guess try it out. I mean, version two you probably means it's quite good. I personally prefer command line and yeah, you probably know that. So, you know, but uh, nonetheless, do check it out. And that sounds interesting. Next thing we got here, and I think this is the last release of the week is Microsoft Edge beta channel. Microsoft Edge is finally, uh, uh, let me try that again. Microsoft Edge is finally reached the beta stage. So you can now actually get the beta builds for Windows and Mac OS. And uh, it is damn good. Like I cannot wait for the stable release and I probably will switch to it once it's released. So I've been using it on and off in beta version because it lacks some of the synchronization features that I really want to have. Uh, other than that, it is a lot faster than Chrome. It is, I mean, Microsoft team is already doing amazing by contributing back to Chrome. There's already seen like a bunch of uh, features that they're going to be pioneering there. And it is really cool. So quite great to see that. And uh, yes, cannot wait for the stable release, which is probably going to happen with it within the next couple of months. Um, all right, this is it for the releases. Now we're coming to the libraries and demos section. The first library of the week is React Node GUI. So this is um, this is an interesting one. So there's this Node GUI framework, which is a wrapper around Qt. So it allows you to take Node code and build a UI app that will actually not use Electron, but will actually use Qt and produce the Qt UI, which is super small, efficient and everything, right? And uh, React Node GUI is a wrapper that allows you to use Qt by writing React code, which is just crazy when you think about it, but it actually seems to be working really well. There's a bunch of tutorials and demos and it is mind blowingly good. So if you are into this sort of, um, if that sounds interesting to you, basically, the cool thing is it actually supports CSS for styling. This is like another thing that I wanted to know. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It seems to be very, very cool. I, I'm not sure about the portability. I'm guessing you would have to have Qt installed separately, but uh, nonetheless, it is very impressive. Okay, next thing we got here is Ruffle. Yeah, this is a thing that I did not expect to see, but there we go, obviously that had to happen at some point. Uh, it's a Flash Player emulator written in Rust that you can compile to WebAssembly and then run uh, Flash files in a browser using WebAssembly instead of the Flash itself, which is uh, mind blowing and also really awesome, especially considering that the Flash Player is um, getting sunsets in 2020, I believe. So uh, no longer, you, I mean, you will basically still be able to run the old Flash plugins using this thing and it, it works surprisingly well. Um, I think I have, yeah, there you go. So this is like, this is actual Flash SVF running in the browser using WebAssembly emulated Flash environment, which is just mind blowing. And um, yeah, if, if you're curious how that works or maybe you want to use it, do check it out. It's called Ruffle, it's written in Rust and uh, seems to be pretty awesome. Next library we got here or demo, I guess, is React Discord clone. It's a pretty nice study material, I guess. It's literally a Discord clone written in React with all the sidebars and channels and everything you ever wanted to have. It's, yeah, as I said, you know, it's a nice learning material. <clears throat> Uh, but yeah, there you go. If that sounds interesting, do check it out. 
Next thing we got here is Thunderclap. Now this is an interesting one. So there is the Cloudflare and they have Cloudflare workers and they also have the Cloudflare key value storage that also lives on the edge, right? So somebody took those two and combined them into the Thunderclap, which is a key value index JSON store that lives on those edge workers and uses the edge key value storage from Cloudflare. Um, yeah, it is a bit crazy, but it seems to be working. And uh, I guess if you're using Cloudflare, this might be a very nice uh, thing for you. So do check this one out. Next thing we got here is Airframe React, free open source, high quality dashboard based on Bootstrap 4 and React 16. It actually is very sleek looking, has a ton of widgets and tons of uh, pages that basically already exist and you can just tweak them and connect them to the API you are using. There is like 2 million features. So um, yeah, I guess, you know, if you are in need of um, very complex admin panel, then do check this one out. It seems to have just about everything you might ever want. Next thing we got here is PyNode, Node.js and Python interop. So this one is also in the category of crazy stuff. It literally allows you to call Python code from Node.js. And uh, yeah, you just, you know, uh, run times, so you don't have to compile anything. You require PyNode, you load some uh, libraries, you standard interpreter, and then you open the file and then you can just call the methods from that file as if it were JavaScript, which is pretty crazy. Seems to be only working with Python 3.6 uh, and 3.7. Probably won't work with Python 2.7, the author never tested. It is an experimental module, so keep that in mind. But nonetheless, it's a really nice example of how you can go completely bonkers with interop between languages. Next thing we got here is Chunky, a file browser component for React. Um, yeah, it's just a very nice uh, file browser. So if you ever needed a file browser and you wanted to uh, have a React component that basically does everything for you, do check this one out. It seems to be pretty full featured, has a very nice layout, supports a bunch of files, previews and all that kind of stuff. Next thing we got here is Nact, Node.js plus Actors. Uh, as it uh, describes itself for Redux, but for the server, um, it's a very weird concept. I mean, I get what they're trying to do, but I never had a problem with managing state and server because primarily your state is usually in a database. Nonetheless, if you ever wanted Redux for backends, then do check this one out. There are some interesting concepts here. So maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. Next thing we got here is an input node library for Google Chrome Labs uh, from Google Chrome. What is wrong with me today? Okay, let's try this again. Input knob from Google Chrome Labs. It's a rotating touch sensitive knob web component that you can use uh, by just specifying input type range. And uh, yes, it's like a full on drawn knob that allows you to customize stuff and uh, looks quite nice. And uh, I, yeah, I, I guess, you know, where's my knob? There we go. So yes, and it's, you know, it works with touch and everything and you can rotate it and you can customize it. It's CSS friendly and everything. So if you're ever looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Spring.js. Uh, this is sort of all-in-one framework for uh, building backends. I guess it's a throwback to Java Spring, which just bring me like Vietnam styled uh, flashbacks that I had with terrible code bases, but um, nonetheless, sort of all in one thing that includes Express, database, and a bunch of other things. Uh, for some reason, by default, database is just a key value store, but I guess that's usually enough. So if you uh, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Postwoman, an uh, API request builder, essentially uh, open source version of Postman. So if you're ever looking, uh, were looking for something like this or wanted to self-host something like this for your own API, do check it out. This is actually quite nice. <clears throat> Next thing we got here is Fusion.js, a framework from, um, what was the name of it? Uber. Uh, so this is from the Uber guys. This is an all-in framework that combines the backend with React Redux tooling. So you get like all-in-one stuff. I guess similarly to what the Next.js offers as of the latest version. It also provides the GraphQL Apollo and stuff like this. It uh, looks pretty cool actually. So if you are interested in that, do check it out. This seems to have quite a lot of uh, features. 
bundled in, including internationalization, React Router, RPC, Redux, and logging error handling, obviously. So sort of very nice all in one package. Um, yeah, again, you know, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is throttles, a tiny utility to regulate the execution rate of your functions. Um, just uh, 139 bytes for single or 204 bytes for priority version that just allows you to throttle execution of a bunch of functions that uh, yeah, seems to be very straightforward, very simple. If you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is create React library. So if you ever needed to create React, like, okay, let me rephrase that. If you are using create React app, and if you ever thought, I wish I had something like this for library, this is exactly what it does. So scaffolds the library for you and manages all the scripts and publishing and everything. And uh, it is quite nice. I've used it to build a couple of libs and it works very well and uh, can quite highly recommend it. Right, and the last thing we got here today is charts.xkcd, xkcd style chart library that allows you to do styles, uh, sorry, charts that look, where's my, where's my JavaScript? No, that's not a button I wanted to press. Uh, where is the demos? I, okay, they have demos here, there you go. So basically it allows you to draw charts that looks like xkcd comics that, um, yeah, work, I mean, Pertuni hand-drawn style charts. That's basically what I have to know. Seems to be working quite nicely. And uh, this is basically all I have for today. So as usual, if you guys have any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If you have any links I might have missed this, uh, this week and you think they are good, throw them into the chat as well. If not, we can wrap this up here. As usual, you can find all the mentioned links on the GitHub or on bxjs.dev. If you are watching, uh, you know, if you joined the stream mid uh, in the middle and you want to watch the rest of it, there's going to be VOD available immediately on Twitch after I'm done or in a few hours on the YouTube after I re-upload it there. That's basically it from my side. Seems like we don't really have any more questions or suggestions. So yes, thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Um, have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching the VOD of this and I see you next time. Bye.